Today we are looking at a case from the mid 20th century. So sit back as we go to France. Marcel Petiot was born on the 17th of January 1897 in the French town of Auxerre, which is about 170 kilometers southeast of Paris. From a young age, it was apparent that he was a very intelligent child, but he also displayed some very strange behavioral problems. When he was just 11 years old, he brought his father's gun into school and fired it in class. His behavior got worse after his mother died in 1912 and his father sent him to live with an aunt. He continued to be disruptive, both in and outside school, and was apprehended when he vandalized a post box. He was then charged with theft. However, as he was still relatively young, the police were unable to prosecute him until he had undergone a mandatory psychiatric evaluation, the results of which showed that he had a mental health condition, and thus, no charges were brought against him, and he was sent back to school. Despite his previous arrest, he continued to be disruptive in class and was suspended on various occasions before eventually being sent to study at a special academy in Paris. He finished his education in July of 1915. By now, France was involved in the First World War and by January 1916, Marcel had been called up to serve in the French infantry. He took part in the Second Battle of the Essene where he was wounded and exposed to gas. Following this, his behavior became a concern to his officers and after being assessed, it was believed that he had suffered a mental breakdown. He was subsequently sent to an army recovery home, where his behaviour continued to be somewhat strange. He was arrested for stealing blankets, morphine, and other army supplies, as well as wallets, photographs, and letters. He was sent to jail in Orléans to await his trial. The judge passed a verdict of not guilty, as after reviewing the medical reports, he believed Marcel to be insane, and ordered that he be sent to a psychiatric hospital. However, he only spent a short time there, despite being diagnosed with a psychiatric condition. He was returned to the front line in June 1918, but three weeks later, he was back in the military hospital after somehow shooting himself in the foot. He was eventually discharged from the army for abnormal behavior, even though some doctors believed that he should have been institutionalized. Following the end of the war, Marcel left the psychiatric unit and took advantage of the government's accelerated education program, which was set up for French war veterans. He studied medicine and was a very impressive student, managing to complete his classroom studies in just eight months. He then returned to the psychiatric hospital in the city of Evreux in northern France, but not as a patient. He was there to serve a two-year internship. He obtained his medical degree in December 1921 and set up his own medical practice in the town of villeneuve sur yvonne which was close to Auxerre. He was now able to earn money from the government and from private patients. He worked hard and became quite a popular figure amongst the local people, many of whom seemed to ignore the rumors that Marcel was in fact involved in some dubious medical practices. Without the knowledge of his patients, he would enroll them into the state-funded medical assistance program this meant that he was able to charge both the government and the patient for his services. He had a girlfriend, a young lady named Louise de Lavaux. She was a daughter of one of his patients. They would often be seen out together. But in May 1926, she went missing. Worried about her daughter, Madame de Lavaux contacted the police. However, they were quite dismissive of her concerns and thought that the young lady had probably ran away. Maybe she was with child or perhaps she just wanted to make her way to the bright lights of Paris. A week later, a large trunk was found in the river and contained unidentifiable remains of a female. Marcel's neighbours had told the police that at the time Louise de Lavaux went missing, they had seen him loading a trunk into his car. The police did not believe the woman in the trunk was Miss de Lavaux and did not investigate further. It was also in 1926 that Marcel decided to try and enter politics and enrolled himself as a candidate to be mayor of the town. Wanting to guarantee victory, he hired an accomplice to disrupt a political debate with his opponents. His plan worked, and he won the election. Now he was mayor of villeneuve sur yvonne and a well-known character in the area. He was married in June 1927 to a 23-year-old lady named Georgette Labbé. She was the daughter of a wealthy landowner, and in April 1928, she gave birth to a baby boy. Marcel Petiot, who years earlier had been placed in a psychiatric hospital and considered insane by some medical professionals, 
was now a respectable doctor, mayor of the town, and married with a child. From a difficult start, he had managed to make a very respectable life for himself. However, the rumours about his medical practices continued. He had a reputation for supplying narcotics, performing illegal terminations, stealing, and engaging in dubious financial arrangements. On the 30th of March, 1930, there was a fire in the house of a gentleman named Armand Dubov. He was not home at the time, and when the fire was extinguished, his wife Henriette was discovered dead in the property. She had been beaten with a blunt object. Police suspected that she had interrupted a robbery as a large amount of money was reported to be missing. Some believed that she had been involved in a relationship with Dr. Petiot. He had been seen near her home on a number of occasions. A gentleman named Monsieur Fisco told the police that he had seen the doctor outside her house on the night of the crime. This information was given to the police in confidence. However, Monsieur Fisco mysteriously died after a routine visit to Dr. Petiot's practice. In August 1931, Marcel was eventually suspended from his position as mayor. He did, however, save the local authorities any embarrassments by resigning. Angry at the way he had been treated, many members of the town council also resigned in protest. Two months later, in October 1931, he was elected as a councillor of the Avon department, but this did not last long, as the following year he was accused of stealing electricity from the town and lost his council seats. He was tried and found guilty, and the judge fined him and ordered him to serve 15 days in prison. He appealed the conviction, and in 1933, relocated to Paris. In Paris, Marcel set up a practice at 66, Rue de Coumartin. But again, rumours started to circulate about his illegal activities, which included prescribing addictive medication. When one of his patients died, an autopsy showed that she had taken excessive amounts of morphine. The coroner, however, returned a verdict of death by natural causes. And instead of the medical administration becoming more aware of Dr. Marcel Petiot, he was instead granted the authority to be able to write death certificates. Over the next few years, he built up a popular practice, but his strange behaviour continued. In April 1936, he was caught stealing from a shop and subsequently assaulted the policeman who tried to apprehend him. He escaped, but later gave himself up to the authorities. He was, however, not prosecuted, as after presenting his military discharge papers to the police, they decided not to pursue the matter further, although he was instructed to spend some more time in a psychiatric hospital, where despite the concerns of the doctors, he was released soon after. On the 3rd of September 1939, France declared war on Germany, and by mid-June 1940, the German army had taken control of Paris. Some French citizens were drafted for forced labour in Germany, Marcel, however, thought that he could make money from this and for a payment would provide a false medical disability certificate to those who were drafted. During this time, he would tell people that he was part of the resistance movement, claiming that he had developed weapons that could kill German soldiers without leaving any forensic evidence. He also said that he had planted bombs and had met with high-ranking Allied commanders. Forging a reputation as a member of the resistance helped him with what would be his most profitable venture, he claimed that he was able to get those who were wanted by the Germans or the Vichy government safely out of France. He said that he could do this by arranging their safe transport to Spain and onto Portugal, where they would then take a ship to Argentina, and he could do this for a cost of 25,000 francs per person. He was aided by three men named Raoul Fourier, Edmond Bintard and René Nézondé. They would spread the word in Paris that there was an evacuation route out of the country. They used the code name Dr. Eugene, and people would come to Dr. Petiot's practice and pay him money. They would include members of the Jewish community, resistance fighters, and criminals. However, they would never actually leave Paris, as before they were given the instructions as to when and where they would start their journey to freedom. Dr. Petiot would tell them that before they left, they would need to be vaccinated against certain diseases. He would then inject them with cyanide before taking all of their items of value and disposing of their bodies. At first, he disposed of them by throwing them in the River Seine, but this meant having to go out at night and risking getting caught. So he started to put the bodies in a furnace that he had in the basement of 21 Rue Le Sur. Marcel had purchased the house in 1941. It was in an affluent area, close to the Arc de Triomphe. 
As bodies were found in the river, the police tried to identify them, but it was difficult, as they had all been dismembered. The German authorities and the French Gestapo seemed less concerned, as they were trying to find a group who apparently arranged for wanted people to leave Paris and find their way to Spain and into Portugal before going by boat to Argentina. Marcel continued to grow his practice, and it proved good cover for his illicit operation. In 1942, he was charged with over-prescribing narcotics to patients. In a bizarre trial, the two patients who had agreed to testify in court strangely disappeared. Marcel was fined 2,400 francs. By now, the name Dr. Marcel Petiot was becoming more infamous, and eventually, he became known to the Gestapo. They heard that he had claimed to be able to help people escape France, so believing that he was part of the French resistance, they apprehended him, along with his three accomplices. They then tortured the men for information. However, the four men could not give any, as they had none. There was no escape route to Argentina, as unbeknown to the authorities, Dr. Marcel Petiot had just been taking the money from the people who needed to escape the country, and then injected them with cyanide and disposed of their bodies. The four men were sent to prison, but by January 1944, they had all been released. On the 11th of March 1944, people who lived in Rue Le Sur noticed smoke coming from one of the houses. It was number 21, and it wasn't the first time that this has happened. A lady knocked on the door, but no one was home. Fearing the fire may spread, the neighbours contacted the fire brigade. Police were also summoned and were informed that the owner of the property was a gentleman named Dr. Marcel Petiot, but he actually lived a short distance away, at 66 Rue Comorton. They were told that over the past few months, unknown visitors had arrived at the house, mostly late at night. The officers contacted Dr. Petiot, who hurriedly made his way to 21 Rue Le Sur. By the time he arrived, firemen had already entered the building. The smoke was getting worse, and the smell was quite strange. They soon realised that the fire was coming from the basement. They made their way to the furnace, where they were shocked to see that amongst the coal were human bones and dismembered human body parts. What happened next was quite bizarre. After Dr. Petiot had confirmed that the policemen were indeed French and not working for the Germans, he told them that it was imperative that he was allowed to enter the building to retrieve some very important documents. He said that he was one of the leaders of a French resistance group and that the bodies inside were all enemies of France. The policemen believed his story. It seemed plausible. After all, this gentleman was a doctor and although he was not known to them, they considered that he must be a distinguished member of the local community. Commissioner Georges Victor Massou arrived and immediately ordered that the house be searched. Police then discovered more human remains, this time in a quicklime pit in the backyard and in canvas bags. They believed that there are at least 10 victims, but realised that there are almost certainly many more who are unaccounted for. The commissioner asked to speak to the property owner, but it was not possible, as Dr. Marcel Petiot had disappeared. Officers were dispatched to his apartment, but when they arrived, he was not there. It was apparent that he had left in a hurry. They did, however, find chloroform and other poisons. When the authorities investigated the doctor, they discovered that he had previously been arrested, as he had been suspected of trying to arrange passage for citizens who needed to leave the country. One witness told them how when he considered trying to flee to Argentina, Dr. Marcel Petiot had told him that he could arrange this for the sum of 25,000 francs. Madame Georgette Petiot, the wife of Marcel, was arrested, as were the three men who the police believed were his accomplices. Despite all the resources available to the police and the Gestapo, the search was unsuccessful, and over the next seven months, there was no sign of Dr. Marcel Petiot. He had in fact taken the name Henri Valéry and joined the French forces of the interior and risen in rank to captain in charge of counter-espionage and prisoner interrogations. The police thought that he had probably left the city, but realised he was still in Paris when the newspaper named Resistance published an article about him. A week later, Dr. Petiot wrote to his lawyer, telling him that the information written in the article was not true. The search for him intensified, and on the 31st of October, he was recognised at a Paris metro station, where he was subsequently arrested. He was then searched, and found to have 31,700 francs on his person, along with a pistol, and over 50 sets of identity documents. 
The trial began on the 18th of May 1946 at the Palais de Justice before a seven-man jury and three judges. The prosecution told the court that Marcel was responsible for at least 27 murders for profits, although they believed there were probably many more. The defendant reacted by claiming he was innocent of all charges and that only responsible for killing enemies of France. He said that he had discovered the bodies at 21 Rue Le Sur in February 1944, but presumed they were people who had been targeted by the resistance. Police investigations had failed to find any links between the defendants and the French resistance groups. In fact, some of the resistance groups that Dr. Petier claimed to be associated with were unknown to all the intelligence services. Prominent figures in the wartime resistance units said they had not been aware of the doctor or his actions against collaborators. Dr. Marcel Petiot was found guilty and sent to the Le Sante prison, where on the 25th of May 1946, he was guillotined. However, his story does not end there, as 34 years later, former US spy master, Colonel John F. Grombach, cited Dr. Marcel Petiot as a World War II source. Colonel Grombach had been the founder and head of a small independent espionage agency, later known as The Pond. While at the time these claims were not supported by any evidence, in 2001 some Pond records were discovered which included a cable that mentioned Dr. Marcel Petiot. Hello everyone and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.